Julia, I, I like to begin by asking if you remember December 7th, 1941. I do. I remember it very well. I was on my way to a girlfriend's house. It was her birthday. And I heard it on the radio that we had bombed, that we had been bombed at Pearl Harbor. And I had never even heard of Pearl Harbor. I was, uh, what was I, about 20, 21, something like that, 20. I must have heard of it, but I didn't know where it was. I had no idea what it would mean to the whole world. It was uh, an odd day. And were you working at that time or a student? I was still in college. Where, where did you go to college? Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon. What were you studying there? Uh, it was a, a general studies course, they called it. Today, I guess they call it humanities. We had a lot of uh, sciences and English and history and sociology, that kind of thing, which equipped you for practically nothing when you got out of college. So I was very fortunate that the war came when it did, as far as I was concerned. What made you decide to join the Navy? Well, all the boys were going. They, In fact, we graduated a month early because the ROTC men were wanted in the service. So we didn't even have finals that year. And that was the only year I made the honor roll, too, <laughs> probably because of that. I read in the paper one day that uh, the Navy was looking for women and for college graduates, and you could walk right in with a commission. You didn't have to go to uh, boot camp or whatever they called it then. So I applied and got in, and uh, that was that. Was there work that you could have done that you didn't and decided to go? I mean, well, I did. When, when I first got out of college, I went to work for the uh, Army Ordnance in the Morrowfield Apartments in uh, Squirrel Hill. They took the whole first floor and painted the windows, and we checked gauges for shells that were being made in the steel mills. And as a group, we were taken over to the steel mills, and the men didn't like it at all, the men that were there. Women had never gone into the steel mills. But at this point, um, they let us in, and there were a lot of Rosie the Riveters there. And it was very interesting, but they wanted us to see what it was we were checking. These were gauges that checked to the thousandths of an inch. Uh, and if you if they go out of, out of what do you call it, uh, out of bounds. That is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, then the shells would not be made to the right specifications and they wouldn't fit the tubes in the submarines and so on. So that was it. Before they let me do that, I had to take a summer course in uh, college algebra and trigonometry, which we did use because some of those gauges were magnificent. They were huge and complicated and they were you had to figure them using math because you couldn't get calipers or anything in among some of them. But I still didn't feel that I was doing as much as I could do. And then when I read the paper about the waves being started, I applied right away. But I worked at the Gage Lab until, uh, until I was called up for the waves. So when you went in the waves, you didn't have to do boot camp or anything like well, that? Well, we had that three months officer training what was that like? That was very nice. We went to Smith College, and being from dirty Pittsburgh at that point, this was early April, and they still had snow in Northampton, and it was clean, and it was just beautiful. And Pittsburgh at that point had no evergreens either. The acid air was just too much for evergreens, and here was a whole country, all of New England, just beautiful. And I'd been raised in Pittsburgh. I'd never seen that part of the world before. It was, uh, it was fascinating. And we were there along with the girls. Nancy Reagan was there when we were there. Nobody knew it at the time, but she graduated that spring that we were there. So for two months, uh, three months, we were there. Uh, one month as just a kind of a general course. <coughs> Excuse me. And then two months of uh, a more detailed course. Everybody wasn't kept for the for the other two months. And what kind of courses were they? What kind of things were you uh, learning? Oh, um, we did a lot of code work, uh, different machines, but they were all very simple machines. Teletype, all that kind of thing. 
we learned that, and we had to learn ships, silhouettes of ships, uh, and of course, Navy history, all kinds of history courses, and a lot of physics. I'm not sure what that was for, but I guess for electric things, I don't know. None of us knew where we were going after this, and a lot of them went, I have no idea where, but I guess we were then equipped to do almost everything that the Navy had to offer. How many of you were there? Um, there were a lot of us. There must have been, I really don't know. There were at least four or five hundred, I'm sure. There were that many. I don't recall. Did you make any friends? Oh, yes. Yeah, like friends that you kept in touch with yeah, at all? Yeah, I had three roommates. We had bunk beds everywhere in the dormitories, and uh, that was good. Then for the last month, we were in the Northampton Hotel, which is still there and quite a... Uh, it was a lovely hotel. We had the bridal suite, eight of us, <laughs> for each room with a connecting bath. So that was very nice. It was hard. They, they really worked us. We had to march everywhere. Something, of course, that we never did again, but that's, that's what the Navy did. Then I was sent to Washington, D.C., and everybody went everywhere. And, of course, I didn't hear from a lot of them again, ever. But I kept in touch with my roommates. And the one roommate and I took an apartment together in Washington. We stayed at the barracks for four or five months, and we had to get out because others were coming in. So we, the officers had to get a, apartments or a room or whatever they wanted. So we got a third-floor walk-up room on... Uh, in the Georgetown area of Washington, which is now very posh, but it wasn't then. But it was fun. It was a Washington was great in wartime. What was Washington like in wartime? It was, well, there were not very many cars, although there still were a lot of cars. But you couldn't get an automobile then. You couldn't. You could buy a used one, but that was all. They weren't making cars. There were people, there were uniforms from everywhere, all over the world. Everybody you knew came through Washington sooner or later. They were uh, always looking for a room, and we had three or four pull-out couches in our place, so we never knew who was sleeping there. It was a friend of Sandy's or a friend of mine or whatever. We had our bedroom and a sun porch in the back of the apartment, and that was off limits to anybody else, but this was ours. And she married a man named Parsons, and I married a man named Parsons. Her husband was in the Coast Guard, and mine was in the Army. So we both got married in Washington. And I unfortunately have lost track of her, and I don't know what has happened to her. Well, uh, all societies in Washington, all states have a house, a uh, not, uh, not an embassy, but something like it. And the Oklahoma Society was having a big celebration because a whole class of Oklahoma boys, which my husband was one, were getting their commissions. So somebody from the Oklahoma Society invited all of them to come to a uh, buffet, open house type thing, which is very nice. And they called the barracks and they wanted anybody who was from Oklahoma to come. Well, there was only one girl and she wanted to go, but she didn't want to go alone. So three of us went with her, one with a New England accent and me with Pittsburgh, and she was from Oklahoma. I forget where the other girl was from. But we went and put on fake name tags and pretended we knew all about Oklahoma. <laughs> and none of us had ever been there, of course. But uh, anyway, my husband was there, and that's when I met him. And we were married a year, year and a half later. What attracted you to him? I don't know. He was just interesting, funny, played piano. <laughs> just, uh, I, I was not serious at the time. I had no illusions about getting married. I didn't particularly want to. But all of a sudden, it seemed right to, and so we did. And then he went overseas. And then the war was over, and we ended up back in Pittsburgh because I had gone home to live with my parents again. After the war, there, there was nothing to do. You know, All the men were back, and they'd been guaranteed their jobs, so the jobs went back to the men, and, and rightly so. But there was nothing to do for us. So we went back to being the housewife that was what led you away from home in the first place, but uh, it worked out. And I think 
I think that that was the start of women working outside the home. I know when I was uh, in high school, not one of the mothers of any of my friends worked. Not one. Women just didn't, unless they were widowed and had to find something to do, that sort of thing. Or they were nurses or teachers, perhaps, although married teachers couldn't work either. So, so I was a mother in a three times over, and then I read that the Carnegie Tech, Carnegie Mellon now, was taking alumni for courses. So I thought, I'm going to go back and get my teaching certification. So I did, and uh, then I taught for five years at North Allegheny High School. And then we moved to London, and that was the end of my teaching career. <laughs> so, But it was interesting. I liked working, and I think most women do like working. Several of the Navy waves I've met, <clears throat> and a few Army nurses, have told me that their fathers were not happy that they joined. I don't know what your parents were like. My father was, was quite pleased. He was a, a teacher at uh, Carnegie Tech, and he had no boys. He just had my sister and me, and I think he was pleased. They could hang the flag in the window with the star in it, and that was, uh, he, he was very proud of me. And of course, I could never tell him what I was doing, so none, they never, and he died before we were allowed to talk about the work that we did. So he never knew what I was doing. All we could say was, oh, we have office work. That Most of us just do office work. So you went right from Northampton to Washington, D.C., and immediately started working on Enigma? Yeah. Okay. yeah we were sitting in a, a, I guess it's a replacement place in a... Uh, gorgeous little chapel there. This was a girls' school before it was the communications annex. And this was a lovely chapel, little padded seats with doors on the ends of the pews. Really pretty. Anyway, we sat there until somebody came and told us where to go, and somebody came in and said, did anybody speak German? Well, I didn't speak it, but I had a couple of years of it in uh, high school. So I raised my hand, and they shot me off to the German section immediately. That was it. And I learned to uh, do the decode work on the job. The messages would come in from all over the North Sea, uh, Bay of Biscay, all along the French coast. They were receiving towers. And by radio, all of the German uh, messages were sent out over the air. And people would receive them and, I guess, teletype them. And I'm not sure how they came over here. But they came over to uh, Washington, and I guess to all, all over America. I don't know where they went, where all they went. And from that, we had to, uh, we, you couldn't decipher them. This Enigma machine is so complicated that it's really hard to, to describe. It looks like a typewriter. It was about the same size. A keyboard was the same size. But it had a, a series of wheels in it. The wheels were all wired so that no letter that went into the machine would ever come out the same. So when you're trying to decode, if an I comes under an I on the uh, code message, you know you don't have the right thing. No, no, nothing can ever match, which was, I guess, to save them somehow. It was a safety measure for whoever invented the machine, but it worked out nicely for us because it helped a lot in eliminating a lot of things that we thought the message said. The uh, British, somewhere along the way, had sunk a, or shot a submarine that was sinking, and the captain of the submarine ordered all hands off, and the British took them on as uh, prisoners. And the uh, captain then sent his own men on the submarine, which had not yet sunk, and that's how we got the first Enigma machine. They carried it off and the code books and all of the equipment that was necessary to do this. And then he sent another, after he got all that off, he sent another group back to get some more. And unfortunately, they went down with the submarine. The seconds did. But this helped us so much because it gave three months of the code so we could read the traffic for three solid months. Every day, these wheels that are in this machine, there are uh, four of them. And 
each letter went into the machine, came out something else, went into the next wheel, came out something else, the next wheel, and the fourth wheel. So no, no way could it ever come out itself at the other end of the line. And that became the code then. But these wheels were removable and they were changed every day. From, there were six of them in, in the machine we had. And so it could be in any order. So it would be impossible to try to work this out. They said people with mathematical minds tried very hard and a couple of them, I guess, went crazy trying to trace, follow through on this thing. They just couldn't do it. It was a, an almost foolproof machine. But also the setting of these wheels made a difference because each wheel had the alphabet on it and you had to set the top with a, a whatever the setting for the day was, QR or ZY or something like that. That changed every 12 hours. So even if you had the morning's traffic, you didn't have the afternoon's. It was a totally different thing. So to get three months of this from the uh, submarine was just fabulous. At least we now knew what we were working with and how to deal with it. So it was really, uh, whoever invented that machine had a great mind. In any event, uh, we would get these uh, messages and then we would put them on a what looked like ticker tape from a machine that the whole message would be in one line of the letters. And then we would run the two together, what we thought it said and what was there, and if it would fit. You know, was the group count right? Was the time right? Whatever. And eventually we got so we could tell pretty well what uh, what would be coming up at this time. This was only the German submarine traffic. Now, I don't know who did the ship traffic. That was another whole section. Maybe the British did all that, but they couldn't do all of the submarines, so they sent it over to us. For our, and there were a lot of us on there working on that. And where did you do this work again? In Washington, D.C. What, what building? Uh, it's called the it was called the Communications Annex. I don't know if it still is or not. It's right at uh, the end of Massachusetts Avenue, the circle there, Ward Circle. And that's where this school was, and they took over the whole school. The girls' school is still there, and, and the Marine Guards, it's double barbed wire fences all around it, and it's still there. They're still working. They have more radio towers than ever, so I'm sure they're working on Iran and uh, the Middle East. Can you tell me what the girls' school's name was? Do you remember the name of the I school? I don't remember. It wasn't a... Uh, I had a feeling it was a something like Winchester, perhaps, or Ellis, something like that. I don't know. They put up a good fight, but the uh, government took it anyway. And what? when did you... Do you remember the date that you joined the Navy and the date that you went to Washington? Yeah, I went to Washington the uh, July... I think it was the 7th. I had a week off between Northampton and, and uh, Washington. What year? 43. And I went into the service in April, I think it was the 13th, as a matter of fact. We met at the old Keystone Hotel and we marched over to the PNLE station, which is now the uh, restaurant over there, and went out the back door and got on the train and that was it. And I thought goodbye Pittsburgh, but Several years later, here I am back home again. And I like yeah. Pittsburgh. I don't know why I felt that way, but I kept thinking there's so much to see in the world, and I didn't always. Anyway, when we came back to Pittsburgh, my husband went back to college to get his, uh, some graduate work, and then we started on from there. Had you already had, um, they already had Enigma when you joined, or did you join and then they acquired They They had done that before before the U.S. got into the war. This had happened with the thing. But when the three months ran out on the code book, then we were stuck. Then we really had to work. And once in a while, we got a, a break. Our break was when the, when the subs had to surface. They don't do that anymore. With sonar, they can recharge the batteries underwater. But then they couldn't. They had to come on the surface to do the uh, recharging. And then they would wire back to, radio back to home base and say I missed messages 247 through 320 or something like that. And then the base would have to re 
broadcast the messages to them if they were important. And that's how we found out what was important and what wasn't. Because if it were dummy messages or personal messages, you know, like happy birthday or something like that, they didn't repeat those. They tried to keep radio silence as much as they could other than uh, w what they had to do to tell the subs where to go. And, and if we didn't get this broken from day to day, we didn't know where these wolf packs were that were killing our ships from the States. By the thousands, they just... It was, it was, they were helpless. They were just caught in this trap. And the ships went down and all the equipment we were sending to England went down. So we were, we were, uh, once we got going and got rolling on this thing, it, uh, cut the traffic way down. They, somebody in the German high command said, I think they're reading our messages. And they kept saying, no, no, it couldn't possibly be, couldn't be. Then I read somewhere in a book just this last summer, that when the top man died, just before he died, he said, he said, they couldn't have been reading our messages. He still did believe that it could be gotten in, in any way, because of course the, the sub-captain was the one who was supposed to scuttle everything when they were going down, but he didn't think he had time or that it was necessary, so he didn't bother. Do you remember any of the messages that you decoded or received? Oh, yeah, there were a lot of them. That they were mostly, uh, you know, whatever the submarine's name was would uh, number whatever. You, you will rendezvous with somebody in the, they had the ocean, everything divvied up in uh, quadrants with numbers. And we had one of those huge maps in the office that showed where everybody was the last time we knew. And if we didn't break the code for two or three days, we didn't know where they had gone. And then a convoy would leave New York and, or Boston or somewhere and head out to sea right to where the, the uh, wolf pack had been. But we didn't know if they were still there. Nobody knew. So it was pretty vital that we keep up to date as much as we could. But sometimes in repeating the messages to the men that had been underwater, uh, we could match it up with traffic that we had broken earlier, and that would then break it for that day, and it, it, uh, it helped. There were, there were, this is when they first used computers, and the computers were as big as a piano. They were huge, and when you think now what they are, it's just amazing, but uh, they, they would, we would tell the computer, we would draw what we called a menu. It was a, a to B, B to C, C to B, and hope there was a closure in there somewhere and send it to the computer, and it would spit back all the possible wheel orders. And then that message would come up to us. Sometimes if we had too many variables, it would spit out too many options. So we had to get as much as we could on the message. But uh, then we could work out the wheel order somehow. I don't, that was another department that worked out the wheel order, or the uh, setting, the letter setting. If we had the wheel order, we could, with the machine we had, we could work backwards on it. And when we finally got it, then, of course, we would run off the whole day's traffic in uh, German. We didn't do the translating. They had a whole department for that. You were such a young woman, and this was such important work. Well, I was 23 by then. 20, 23 is pretty young. 22. <laughs> yeah, it is now. Of course, I didn't think it was then. You didn't think it was then. But it must have been very uh, a, a really wonderful feeling to... It was. Unfortunately, we couldn't talk about it. My roommate was in the Japanese section, and we never talked about it. And nobody talked about it. It was just safer to not talk about it at all, anything. We could talk about people and the things we did with people, but we never talked about anything. And that, as they said, was the best-kept secret going. And it was in 1997 that I got to Washington to visit an old wave friend of mine, Jean McDevitt. I forget, failed to mention her name when I did that other uh, bit for QED, and she said, you could have mentioned my name. So now she's in. Uh, what was I? Oh, I went to visit her, and she said, there's a new museum open on the old Camp Mead territory, the, the National Security something, I forget. So she said, do you want to go over and look at it? So we did. 
And here was the Enigma machine, all kinds of Enigma machines, earlier ones and later ones, and I didn't even know that we were allowed to talk about it. It was just, it was just a shock to me to see them there and all the computers and calculators and everything. And they're still there. I was there last uh, Thanksgiving. And they're all still there. I took the tour and they got a few things wrong. And when I told them afterward, I said, that, I said, a couple of those things weren't right. And the guy says, oh, who cares? And I thought, oh, there, there goes a little bit of history. You can see how things do get ruined through, the, through being told over and over and over. Tell me, what did they get wrong? Well, one of the, that I remember was we had numbers 1 to 26 for the letters. We had to put them into numbers for the computer. We couldn't use letters. And he had them in, in the uh, lecture and in the little booklet that they published. He had it going from 0 to 25. And I said, but that isn't right. And he said, oh, who cares? So, you know, what can you do? <laughs> it was one of those things. That's the, the main thing I remember. And he had wrong things about times. Things happened, but they weren't, they weren't vital. But it came my fortunate uh, appointment to make a spreadsheet of all the messages we had had for the past six months. We had a, about a week when we couldn't break the traffic no matter what. And so we got this huge sheet and put down all these messages, the time, the, the length of them, the, where they came from, the different control centers. And eventually it came out that at 7.30 at night, which would be 12.30, 7.30, our time, anyway. The same message came every night. It was very short, and it always came at the same time from the same place. And well, we had one over two of them uh, translated, and it was the weather in the Bay of Biscay, in German, of course. And this is what they were doing every night, and they, I don't know what happened to their control over their coding, but everybody knows that you always use a dummy word first. Uh, you don't go right into the message right away, but they forgot to use the dummy word. They just didn't bother, and they used the same wording night after night after night. And that's, of course, we had to wait till night to get the traffic out. But this made it so easy. The only time it missed was when uh, they spelled a biscay with a K instead of a C. And the K threw the whole day's traffic off. We didn't know that till later on when we checked back and wondered what some of those messages said, and we found that was why. But to do a message the same wording over and over is absolutely, as they said, verboten. You just don't do that. But they did, and that was part of their downfall, because from then on we had the traffic broken every day to the end of the war. It was uh, made our work much easier. So. So it was the Bay of Biscay weather report every yeah. night. At that same time, for the next day, that would be uh, the better Vizcaya does uh, and something like that. It was enough of a crib to get the machines working right away. So that was that worked out beautifully. That one little mistake just did it br allowed you to break the code for the rest of the war. Well, the the idea that they that they did the same thing night after night, we could look forward to it. If we could break it earlier on other, with other methods, we did. It was fascinating. There were some very, very good minds in that office. Do you remember some of them, some of those people? The people? Yeah. Uh, there was a Mr. Church who had been a teacher at some woman's college in, uh, I think it was in North Carolina, and a Mr. Reynolds. I don't know if they were mathematics professors or what, but they had all been draft or I guess they volunteered or they were asked, I don't know, but they were very, very smart. Just, it's amazing to see. I always liked math and could do math fairly well, but they were, I was first grade compared to them. They really could work on it. And a lot of decoding is uh, mathematical. So our uh, group on the U-boats was called Shark. That was our department, but there was also one called Bovril and something else. They all had C names of some kind. So there were other little things. They could have been, I don't know what, for ships maybe, or 
con I, I don't know. We, we never knew. They, they, didn't, they didn't really want everybody to know everything. They thought it was safer to have each group know its own thing. So it was a convoluted method, but it, uh, it worked. It worked beautifully. We all got our uh, commendation uh, ribbons after the war. I don't know what I did with mine. It's, I haven't seen it for years. But it was uh, fun. But again, we couldn't talk about it until 1997. And somebody said, oh, it's been, uh, they de declassified it in 19, I think it was 67. I thought, all these years. And by then, of course, I'd never talked about it, so it, it, things do slip away. Just sad. I have a lot of letters I wrote home, but I couldn't say anything. I couldn't say anything about it in the letters. So no, my husband never knew what I did till wait. Well, in 1997, you never told your husband. We never told anybody. This was this was top military secret, and everybody apparently kept it because they never knew that we had their code. So it was uh, it was amazing. And I was lucky enough four or five years ago to get to uh, England, and I went to Bletchley there, which is their uh, decoding place. And they had thrown out everything after the war. They threw out all their Enigma machines, all their notes, all their everything. I don't know why. I still don't know why. They had nothing left. They tore down the buildings, and they had commandeered a huge mansion, and that's still there. And they had a woman who was there. Oh, that was another mistake I caught. I told her after she was telling everybody in the tour through that. She said, that, and we broke the traffic every day. And I went up to her after it. I said, we did break the traffic every day. She said, well, we did. I thought, you know, <laughs> so they'll always be in England, I guess. That's <laughs> At any rate, it was interesting to see their side of it also. But they, uh, they wanted me, and I did for them write down what I knew to try to get their notes back to shape because they're having the same problem we are. The people are gone. They don't know where they've gone. The ones that uh, survived the war and worked there, probably like ours, uh, half of them are dead. So anyway, I sent them what I could and I don't know if they've done it or not, but. Uh, I think I'm still amazed that you didn't tell your husband anything. Well, he knew, he knew that I was doing something secret, but in the war, everybody did something secret. That old loose lips sink ships thing was, was, everybody had that on their mind. Just don't talk about it. Don't talk when, when your husband is going away for six weeks. Don't, just don't tell anybody. And that way things don't get started and so they don't get around. And as far as I know, everybody followed it. So nothing ever did get around. But he was very interested in the machines and the, uh, and the work afterward. Wolfgang von Hagen. I'm hoping somebody will have known him. He was a sub, a German subskipper, and he went to, uh, came to America after the war and married an American woman who was a friend of a friend of mine. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to talk to him? But now this is back in the 50s, so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say anything then. And through the years, we finally, we joined a church in North Park when we'd moved out that direction, and he was an usher there. And he ushered me to a seat one morning, and uh, I kept thinking, oh, I would just love to say something, but I couldn't. So then we moved around the world here and there, and we ended up in Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia had a trade fair every year, and we were there while they had the trade fair, and there was a Westinghouse booth there. My husband was... Uh, Westing, was with Westinghouse building a nuclear power plant in Serbia, in uh, Slovenia at the time. But I heard, I said, is anybody from Pittsburgh there in the Westinghouse booth? And they said, yeah, Wolf von Hagen's there. And I thought, ah, oh, it's time. This was in the 70s, I guess. And I thought, I'm just going to ask him anyway. This is what, 50 years later, 40, 30, whatever it was. So I went down to the fair the next day, and I went to the Westinghouse booth, and I said, is Mr. Von Hagen here? And they said he went home this morning. And by the time we got back to the States again, uh, he had died. I saw in the paper the obituary, and I thought, ah, oh, for heaven's sake. So I never did get to talk to him, and I would love to have talked to him. 
did you ever worry about a convoy going out or? Oh, yes. This, uh, I hope we got it right. Or Gene McDevitt that I was talking about, a uh, husband was a convoy officer and he went out with the convoys regularly, like every, I don't know, I don't remember how long, every six weeks maybe. And every time he went, she came to the room we were in and she said, okay, get busy. Mac left this morning. He's out there. And the convoy's on his way get that traffic broken <laughs> and she'd come by every every hour or so hoping that we had gotten everything broken because she really worried fortunately he made it through the war just fine so he just died last year so but there was a huge german ship that was sunk and the british and whoever was there was trying to save the sailors but Help was on the way. The Air Force was on the way, so they couldn't stay to save the rest of them. And that made the paper, and I remember knowing about that. I don't know that we had anything to do with it, but that was something that, that I did know about that nobody else knew about at the time. And you had to be careful not to say anything. You know, it, would get, it would get through in Germany, of course, and then they would tell people that your brother was killed on the uh, whatever ship was sunk or something like that. The messages were sad, coming, you know, your son sends his love on his fifth birthday, something like that. And of course, as soon as they got their messages, when they had come to surface to charge the batteries again, the one man said, he said, every time we surface, there are planes overhead. So obviously, uh, somebody was reading their code, but they still wouldn't believe it. And of course, the ship was sunk. All it had to do was give away its position, the subs, and that was it. And the planes were there and sunk them. But you got to know some of these people by continued uh, messages. And, and it really it got to bother me after a while. I think it bothered everybody a little bit. These were just people like we were. It, it, you know, they weren't Hitler. They weren't. They were the enemy, but they probably didn't want to be. It was, it was an odd, very odd feeling. Obviously, they had to be sunk, but it was too bad we couldn't have saved more of them. That is an odd feeling, because you do kind of get to know them, I guess. If you're... Yeah, it's like characters in a book. You feel you know them after a while, and while they're doing something you don't want them to do, it still is, you don't necessarily want them dead. But there they go, and there goes the five-year-old's father and the and when I see Germany today, I can't believe how good they are, how prosperous, how organized. They're just amazing, just amazing. And we did it for them too. Of course, they undid it for themselves, but that's another matter. I, I teach a course on America in the 1950s, and, and I also teach a course on World War II, but what I often tell my my students, are, especially the girl, the women students, are often amazed at how you know women were drawn into the workforce with really important jobs, and then, as you said, in the fifties, were expected to kind of go back. Yeah, that's it. Back to the kitchen. That's the uh, that was the feeling, and nobody wanted to. We'd had our moment of glory, and that was to be the end of it, I guess. But that's when women really started out, and schools opened up and took more women. Carnegie Tech, when I went there, you couldn't have taken a course in the engineering building at all. You, you were strictly in the girls' school. And this was, uh, the interesting courses were always somewhere else. So, and I know that was opened up, and right after the war I read that uh, the first girl, first woman, I don't remember her name, had graduated from Carnegie Mellon, engineer had graduated. And I thought, wow, that's, that's progress now. We're, now we're moving. So, and one time while visiting a friend in Detroit, we went out to the St. Lawrence Seaway because he had worked there. He was a sailor in the office. Uh, but he uh, wanted us to see the St. Lawrence Seaway, which I had never seen. And a ship came through the locks while we were there, and a wave was in charge of the crew. You know, she's telling him to roll, roll the rope there, whatever. And there she stood in her uniform. I thought, wow. Because we were never allowed out of the country. That was strictly up. But now I guess they're everywhere, which is good. 
women have certainly come a long way, and I think that we all had a hand in uh, helping them get there. Because women really were uh, secretaries, nurses, teachers. That was about it, unless you had some special skill. That there was not much choice for women. So, let's say I don't know what I would have done. I think I would have probably become a librarian after the war. And how dull would that have been? <laughs> I'd like it now, but not then. Well, I don't think that uh, I don't think we did any more than anybody. Everybody did something. Everybody wanted to do something. Everybody wanted to do something big. <laughs> I'm sure that women would have fought in the trenches if they could have. They were, they were, everybody was ready to go. It was, it was a great time, a great patriotic uh, era. In fact, when I see movies from that time now, I think, my glory, we really were high on the propaganda. The flag kept flurrying in the breeze and the men would go off to their doom in a plane crash uh, uh, while the national anthem is playing, uh, oh dear. At the time, it seemed, it fitted beautifully because that's the way everybody felt.